Chapter 16 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 16. How to Remember Occurrences. The phase of memory which manifests in the recording of and recollection of the occurrences and details of one's everyday life is far more important than would appear at first thought. The average person is under the impression that he remembers very well the occurrences of his everyday business, professional or social life, and is apt to be surprised to have it suggested to him that he really remembers but very little of what happens to him during his waking hours. In order to prove how very little of this kind is really remembered, let each student lay down this book at this place, and then, quieting his mind, let him endeavor to recall the incidents of the same day of the preceding week he will be surprised to see how very little of what happened on that day he is really capable of recollecting. Then let him try the same experiment with the occurrences of yesterday. This result will also excite surprise. It is true that if he is reminded of some particular occurrence, he will recall it, more or less distinctly, but beyond that he will remember nothing. Let him imagine himself called upon to testify in court regarding the happenings of the previous day or the day of the week before, and he will realize his position. The reason for his failure to easily remember the events referred to is to be found in the fact that he made no effort at the time to impress these happenings upon his subconscious mentality. He allowed them to pass from his attention like the proverbial water from the duck's back. He did not wish to be bothered with the recollection of trifles, and in endeavoring to escape from them, he made the mistake of failing to store them away. There is a vast difference between dwelling on the past and storing away past records for possible future reference. To allow the records of each day to be destroyed is like tearing up the important business papers in an office in order to avoid giving them a little space in the files. It is not advisable to expend much mental effort in fastening each important detail of the day upon the mind as it occurs, but there is an easier way that will accomplish the purpose, if one will but take a little trouble in that direction. We refer to the practice of reviewing the occurrences of each day, after the active work of the day is over. If you will give to the occurrences of each day a mental review in the evening, you will find that the act of reviewing will employ the attention to such an extent as to register the happenings in such a manner that they will be available if ever needed thereafter. It is akin to the filing of the business papers of the day, for possible future reference. Besides this advantage, these reviews will serve you well as a reminder of many little things of immediate importance which have escaped your recollection by reason of something that followed them in the field of attention. You will find that a little practice will enable you to review the events of the day in a very short space of time with a surprising degree of accuracy of detail. It seems that the mind will readily respond to this demand upon it. The process appears to be akin to a mental digestion, or rather a mental rumination similar to that of the cow when it chews the cud that it has previously gathered. The thing is largely a knack easily acquired by a little practice. It will pay you for the little trouble and time that you expend upon it. As we have said, not only do you gain the advantage of storing away these records of the day for future use, but you also have your attention called to many important details that have escaped you, and you will find that many ideas of importance will come to you in your moments of leisure rumination. Let this work be done in the evening when you feel at ease, but do not do it after you retire. 
the bed is made for sleep not for thinking you will find that the subconsciousness will awaken to the fact that it will be called upon later for the records of the day and will accordingly take notice of what happens in a far more diligent and faithful manner the subconsciousness responds to a call made upon it in an astonishing manner when it once understands just what is required of it you will see that much of the virtue of the plan recommended consists in the fact that in the review there is an employment of the attention in a manner impossible during the haste and rush of the day's work the faint impressions are brought out for examination and the attention of the examination and review greatly deepen the impression in each case so that it may be reproduced thereafter in a sentence it is the deepening of the faint impressions of the day thurlow weed a well-known politician of the last century testifies to the efficacy of the above-mentioned method in his memoirs his plan was slightly different from that mentioned by us but you will at once see that it involves the same principles the same psychology mr weed says some of my friends used to think that i was cut out for a politician but i saw at once a fatal weakness my memory was a sieve i could remember nothing dates names appointments faces everything escaped me i said to my wife catherine i shall never make a successful politician for i cannot remember and that is a prime necessity of politicians a politician who sees a man once should remember him forever my wife told me that i must train my memory so when i came home that night i sat down alone and spent fifteen minutes trying silently to recall with accuracy the principal events of the day i could remember but little at first now i remember that i could not then recall what i had for breakfast after a few days practice i found i could recall more events came back to me more minutely more accurately and more vividly than at first after a fortnight or so of this catherine said why don't you relate to me the events of the day instead of recalling them to yourself it would be interesting and my interest in it would be a stimulus to you having great respect for my wife's opinion i began a habit of oral confession as it were which was continued for almost fifty years every night the last thing before retiring i told her everything i could remember that had happened to me or about me during the day i generally recalled the very dishes i had for breakfast dinner and tea the people i had seen and what they had said the editorials i had written for my paper giving her a brief abstract of them i mentioned all the letters i had seen and received and the very language used as nearly as possible when i had walked or ridden i told her everything that had come within my observation i found that i could say my lesson better and better every year and instead of the practice growing irksome it became a pleasure to go over again the events of the day i am indebted to this discipline for a memory of unusual tenacity and i recommend the practice to all who wish to store up facts or expect to have much to do with influencing men the careful student after reading these words of thurlow weed will see that in them he has not only given a method of recalling the particular class of occurrences mentioned in this lesson but has also pointed out a way whereby the entire field of memory may be trained and developed the habit of reviewing and telling the things that one perceives does and thinks during the day naturally sharpens the powers of future observation attention and perception 
if you are witnessing a thing which you know that you will be called upon to describe to another person, you will instinctively apply your attention to it. The knowledge that you will be called upon for a description of a thing will give the zest of interest or necessity to it, which may be lacking otherwise. If you will sense things with the knowledge that you will be called upon to tell of them later on, you will give the interest and attention that go to make sharp, clear, and deep impressions on the memory. In this case, the seeing and hearing has a meaning to you, and a purpose. In addition to this, the work of review establishes a desirable habit of mind. If you don't care to relate the occurrences to another person, learn to tell them to yourself in the evening. Play the part yourself. There is a valuable secret of memory embedded in this chapter, if you are wise enough to apply it. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 17 How to Remember Facts In speaking of this phase of memory, we use the word fact in the sense of an ascertained item of knowledge, rather than in the sense of a happening, etc. In this sense, the memory of facts is the ability to store away and recollect items of knowledge bearing upon some particular thing under consideration. If we are considering the subject of horse, the facts that we wish to remember are the various items of information and knowledge regarding the horse that we have acquired during our experience, facts that we have seen, heard, or read regarding the animal in question, and to that which concerns it. We are continually acquiring items of information regarding all kinds of subjects, and yet when we wish to collect them, we often find the task rather difficult, even though the original impressions were quite clear. The difficulty is largely due to the fact that the various facts are associated in our minds only by contiguity in time or place, or both, the associations of relation being lacking. In other words, we have not properly classified and indexed our bits of information, and do not know where to begin to search for them. It is like the confusion of the businessman who kept all his papers in a barrel without index or order. He knew that they were all there, but he had hard work to find any one of them when it was required. Or we are like the compositor whose type has become pied, and then thrown into a big box. When he attempts to set up a book page, he will find it very difficult, if not impossible, whereas if each letter were in its proper box, he would set up the page in a short time. This matter of association by relation is one of the most important things in the whole subject of thought, and the degree of correct and efficient thinking depends materially upon it. It does not suffice us to merely know a thing. We must know where to find it when we want it. As old Judge Sharswood of Pennsylvania once said, it is not so much to know the law as to know where to find it. Kay says, over the associations formed by contiguity in time or space, we have but little control. They are in a manner accidental, depending upon the order in which the objects present themselves to the mind. On the other hand, association by similarity is largely put in our own power, for we, in a measure, select those objects that are to be associated and bring them together in the mind. We must be careful, however, only to associate together such things as we wish to be associated together, and to recall each other, and the associations we form should be based on fundamental and essential, 
and not upon mere superficial or casual resemblances. When things are associated by their accidental, and not by their essential qualities, by their superficial and not by their fundamental relations, they will not be available when wanted, and will be of little real use. When we associate what is new with what most nearly resembles it in the mind already, we give it its proper place in our fabric of thought. By means of association by similarity, we tie up our ideas, as it were, in separate bundles, and it is of the utmost importance that all the ideas that most nearly resemble each other be in one bundle. The best way to acquire correct associations, and many of them, for a separate fact that you wish to store away, so that it may be recollected when needed, some useful bit of information or interesting bit of knowledge that may come in handy later on is to analyze it and its relations. This may be done by asking yourself questions about it. Each thing that you associate it with in your answers being just one additional cross-index, whereby you may find it readily when you want it. As Kay says, the principle of asking questions and obtaining answers to them may be said to characterize all intellectual effort. This is the method by which Socrates and Plato drew out the knowledge of their pupils, filling in the gaps and attaching new facts to those already known. When you wish to so consider a fact, ask yourself the following questions about it. 1. Where did it come from or originate? 2. What caused it? 3. What history or record has it? 4. What are its attributes, qualities, and characteristics? 5. What things can I most readily associate with it? What is it like? 6. What is it good for? How may it be used? What can I do with it? 7. What does it prove? What can be deduced from it? 8. What are its natural results? What happens because of it? 9. What is its future and its natural or probable end or finish? 10. What do I think of it on the whole? What are my general impressions regarding it? 11. What do I know about it in the way of general information? 12. What have I heard about it, and from whom, and when? If you will take the trouble to put any fact through the above rigid examination, you will not only attach it to hundreds of convenient and familiar other facts, so that you will remember it readily upon occasion, but you will also create a new subject of general information in your mind, of which this particular fact will be the central thought. Similar systems of analysis have been published and sold by various teachers at high prices, and many men have considered that the results justified the expenditure. So do not pass it by lightly. The more other facts that you manage to associate with any one fact, the more pegs will you have to hang your facts upon, the more loose ends will you have whereby to pull that fact into the field of consciousness the more cross-indexes will you have whereby you may run down the fact when you need it. The more associations you attach to a fact, the more meaning does that fact have for you, and the more interest will be created regarding it in your mind. Moreover, by so doing, you make very probable the automatic or involuntary recollection of that fact when you are thinking of some of its associated subjects. That is, it will come into your mind naturally in connection with something else, in a that-reminds-me fashion. And the oftener that you are involuntarily reminded of it, the clearer and deeper does its impression become on the records of your memory. The oftener you use a fact, the easier does it become to recall it when needed. The favorite pen of a man is always at his hand, 
in a remembered position, while the less used eraser or similar thing has to be searched for, often without success. And the more associations that you bestow upon a fact, the oftener it is likely to be used. Another point to be remembered is that the future association of a fact depends very much upon your system of filing away facts. If you will think of this when endeavoring to store away a fact for future reference, you will be very apt to find the best mental pigeonhole for it. File it away with the thing it most resembles, or to which it has the most familiar relationship. The child does this involuntarily. It is nature's own way. For instance, the child sees a zebra. It files away that animal as a donkey with stripes. A giraffe as a long-necked horse. A camel as a horse with long crooked legs, long neck, and humps on its back. The child always attaches its new knowledge or fact onto some familiar fact or bit of knowledge. Sometimes the result is startling, but the child remembers by means of it nevertheless. The grown-up children will do well to build similar connecting links of memory. Attach the new things to some old familiar thing. It is easy when you once have the knack of it. The table of questions given a little farther back will bring to mind many connecting links. Use them. If you need any proof of the importance of association by relation and of the laws governing its action, you have but to recall the ordinary train of thought or train of images in the mind of which we become conscious when we are daydreaming or indulging in reverie or even in general thought regarding any subject. You will see that every mental image or idea or recollection is associated with and connected to the preceding thought and the one following it. It is a chain that is endless until something breaks into the subject from outside. A fact flashes into your mind, apparently from space and without any reference to anything else. In such cases, you will find that it occurs either because you had previously set your subconscious mentality at work upon some problem or bit of recollection, and the flash was the belated and delayed result, or else that the fact came into your mind because of its association with some other fact, which in turn came from a precedent one, and so on. You hear a distant railroad whistle, and you think of a train then of a journey, then of some distant place, then of someone in that place, then of some event in the life of that person, then of a similar event in the life of another person, then of that other person, then of his or her brother, then of that brother's last business venture, then of that business, then of some other business resembling it then of some people in that other business, then of their dealings with a man you know, then of the fact that another man of a similar name to the last man owes you some money, then of your determination to get that money, then you make a memorandum to place the claim in the hands of a lawyer to see whether it cannot be collected now, although the man was execution-proof last year. From distant locomotive whistle to the possible collection of the account. And yet, the links forgotten, the man will say that he just happened to think of the debtor, or that it somehow flashed right into my mind, etc. But it was nothing but the law of association, that's all. Moreover, you will now find that whenever you hear mentioned the term association of mental ideas, etc., you will remember the above illustration, or part of it. We have forged a new link in the chain of association for you, and years from now it will appear in your thoughts. End of chapter 17 
Chapter 18 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 18. How to Remember Words, Etc. In a preceding chapter, we gave a number of instances of persons who had highly developed their memory of words, sentences, etc. History is full of instances of this kind. The moderns fall far behind the ancients in this respect, probably because there does not exist the present necessity for the feats of memory which were once accepted as commonplace and not out of the ordinary. Among ancient people, when printing was unknown and manuscripts scarce and valuable, it was the common custom of the people to learn by heart the various sacred teachings of their respective religions. The sacred books of the Hindus were transmitted in this way, and it was a common thing among the Hebrews to be able to recite the books of Moses and the prophets entirely from memory. Even to this day, the faithful Mohammedans are taught to commit the entire Koran to memory, and investigation reveals, always, that there has been used the identical process of committing these sacred books to memory and recalling them at will, the natural method, instead of an artificial one. And therefore we shall devote this chapter solely to this method whereby poems or prose may be committed to memory and recalled readily. This natural method of memorizing words, sentences, or verses is no royal road. It is a system which must be mastered by steady work and faithful review. One must start at the beginning and work his way up. But the result of such work will astonish anyone not familiar with it. It is the very same method that the Hindus, Hebrews, Mohammedans, Norsemen, and the rest of the races memorized their thousands of verses and hundreds of chapters of the sacred books of their people. It is the method of the successful actor and the popular elocutionist, not to mention those speakers who carefully commit to memory their impromptu addresses and extemporaneous speeches. This natural system of memorizing is based upon the principle which has already been alluded to in this book and by which every child learns its alphabet and its multiplication table, as well as the little piece that it recites for the entertainment of its fond parents and the bored friends of the family. That principle consists of the learning of one line at a time and reviewing that line, then learning a second line and reviewing that, and then reviewing the two lines together, and so on, each edition being reviewed in connection with those that went before. The child that learns the sound of A, then it learns B, then it associates the sound of A, B in its first review. The C is added, and the review runs, A, B, C, and so on until Z is reached, and the child is able to review the entire list from A to Z, inclusive. The multiplication table begins with its twice one is two, then twice two is four, and so on, a little at a time, until the twos are finished and the threes begun. This process is kept up by constant addition and constant review until twelve twelves finishes up the list and the child is able to repeat the tables from first to last from memory. But there is more to it, in the case of the child, than merely learning to repeat the alphabet or the multiplication table. There is also the strengthening of the memory as a result of its exercise and use. Memory, like every faculty of the mind, or every muscle of the body, improves and develops by intelligent and reasonable use and exercise. Not only does this exercise and use develop the memory along the particular line of the faculty used, but also along every line and faculty. This is so because the exercise develops the power of concentration and the use of the voluntary attention. 
we suggest that the student who wishes to acquire a good memory for words sentences etc begin at once selecting some favorite poem for the purpose of the demonstration then let him memorize one verse of not only four to six lines to begin with let him learn this verse perfectly line by line until he is able to repeat it without a mistake let him be sure to be letter perfect in that verse so perfect that he will see even the capital letters and the punctuation marks when he recites it then let him stop for the day the next day let him repeat the verse learned the day before and then let him memorize a second verse in the same way and just as perfectly then let him review the first and second verses together this addition of the second verse to the first verse serves to weld the two together by association and each review of them together serves to add a little bit to the weld until they become joined in the mind as are a b c the third day let him learn a third verse in the same way and then review the three continue this for say a month adding a new verse each day and adding to it the verses preceding it but constantly review them from beginning to end he cannot review them too often he will be able to have them flow along like the letters of the alphabet from a to z if he reviews properly and often enough then if he can spare the time let him begin the second month by learning two verses each day and adding to those that precede them with constant and faithful reviews he will find that he can memorize two verses in the second month as easily as he did the one verse in the first month his memory has been trained to this extent and so he may proceed from month to month adding an extra verse to his daily task until he is unable to spare the time for all the work or until he feels satisfied with what he has accomplished let him use moderation and not try to become a phenomenon let him avoid overstraining after he has memorized the entire poem let him start with a new one but not forget to revive the old one at frequent intervals if he finds it impossible to add the necessary number of new verses by reasons of other occupation etc let him not fail to keep up his review work the exercise and review is more important than mere addition of so many new verses let him vary the verses or poems with prose selections he will find the verses of the bible very well adapted for such exercise as they lend themselves easily to registration in the memory shakespeare may be used to advantage in this work the rubaiyat of omar khayyam or the lady of the lake by scott or the song celestial or light of asia both by edwin arnold will be found to be well adapted to this system of memorizing the verses of each being apt to stick in the memory and each poem being sufficiently long to satisfy the requirements of even the most ambitious student to look at the complete poem any of those mentioned it would seem almost impossible that one would ever be able to memorize and recite it from beginning to end letter perfect but on the principle of the continual dripping of water wearing away the stone or the snowball increasing at each roll this practice of a little being associated to what he already has will soon allow him to accumulate a wonderfully large store of memorized verses poems recitations etc it is an actual demonstration of the catchy words of the popular song which informs one that every little bit added to what you've got makes just a little bit more after he has acquired quite a large assortment of memorized selections he will find it impossible to review them all at one time but he should be sure to review them all at intervals no matter how many days may elapse between each review the student who has familiarized himself with the principles upon which memory depends as given in the preceding chapters 
will at once see that the three principles of attention, association, and repetition are employed in the natural method herein recommended. Attention must be given in order to memorize each verse in the first place. Association is employed in the relationship created between the old verses and the new ones, and repetition is employed by the frequent reviewing, which serves to deepen the memory impression each time the poem is repeated. Moreover, the principle of interest is invoked in the gradual progress made, and the accomplishment of what at first seemed to be an impossible task, the game element is thus supplied, which serves as an incentive. These combined principles render this method an ideal one, and it is not to be wondered that the race has so recognized it from the earliest times. End of chapter 18 Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.